I'd like to welcome everyone to the first lecture of our Spring 2014 series um, in the IMAX Theater. And i um, just like to make a couple of acknowledgments. I'm acknowledging the great, generous, ongoing support from the Lowell Institute that enables us to offer these programs free of charge. And they've been supporting us for many years. We're grateful for that. And we're also grateful for the volunteer I heard from the Harvard Extension School Environmental Club, who is helping out at the uh, check-in table uh, this week and annual season. Um, we have 10 great lectures coming up this season, and hope everyone keeps coming back and tells their friends. We have plenty of room in the IMAX theater. Um, next week, we have uh, Chef Bart Siever, who's um, also a wild fisheries uh, you know, expert in terms of cooking and wild fisheries uh, specialist in terms of research test gears, um, so you can learn more about um, forage fish. And I guess also not only how to sustainably catch them, but how to eat them. <laughs> Um, and I also wanted to share with folks some important news at the aquarium today. Um, uh, after um, great, very successful nine-year tenure here, helping to really revitalize and renovate the New England Aquarium, um, and really helping to expand our research and conservation work, um, our CEO and President Bud Riss over here will uh, finally be leaving us. Uh, he will be stepping down um, shortly. And um, he will soon be succeeded um, at the end of May by uh, Dr. Nigel Hilgarth, who is currently director of the Birch Aquarium at Scripps uh, at UC San Diego. And she will be arriving here at the end of May. But I'd like to just take a moment to please join in thanking Bud for his incredible work here. but at these lectures, but we hope we'll come back. He does live in the neighborhood. I'll be here. <laughs> and I'd like to now introduce uh, my uh, colleague, Heather Tausig, who's VP of Conservation, and she will introduce uh, tonight's speaker. Thank you. Welcome, everybody. Um, again, my name is Heather Tausig. I'm the Vice President of Conservation here at the Aquarium. And it's, um, actually, maybe I can see a show of hands of people who have been to a lecture before here at the Aquarium. Wonderful. Well, for those of you that are new to the New England Aquarium and um, our lecture series, we have obviously a wonderful venue with which to showcase um, important work that's going on in the world uh, around oceans and ocean research and conservation. And we like to highlight a number of people that um, work out in the field and also our own scientists as well. So I just want to let you know um, a few things about sort of our, in, in some ways, connections to um, our speaker, Shah Selby, who I'm going to introduce to you. Um, but as we think about uh, conservation technology, one of the things that's important, certainly for those of you new to the aquarium to know, is that the aquarium has obviously a strong commitment to education and outreach and showcasing the incredible animals that you know sort of give you that wow factor to care about the oceans. But we also have a long-standing research and conservation initiative here at the aquarium. And in some ways, a lot of the work that you'll hear about tonight touches on um, a lot of things that we've done here for a number of years. So I wanted to give you just a flavor for some of the things that um, that will be sort of related to some of the work that you're hearing tonight before I introduce Shaw. Um, one thing that actually was a really important for connection uh, with us, with this speaker, was that we have um, a fund here called the Marine Conservation Action Fund. And this is really funding, uh, it's a small granting program that actually was kicked off with funding from both individual donors, some of you here in the audience, and also uh, foundations such as the Oak and Munson Foundation, who I believe we also have some representatives here. So we really appreciate that support. And the Marine Conservation Action Fund is a way to um, turn around essentially small scale grants that usually are around five to $10,000, often in developing countries where um, that kind of funding goes a long way, but to scientists and conservationists who can address time sensitive pro um, problems that the ocean is facing and work often with grassroots communities. And we have a wonderful advisory board, some of you here in the audience for that. And we awarded uh, Shaw um, in 2012 an MCAF grant to share some of his work with the broader seafood community that is thinking about um, illegal, unreported, and um, unregulated fishing. So we talk about IUU fishing a lot. Here at the aquarium, we also have a sustainable seafood program. And um, I know we have people in the audience. We're going to take some time after as well, um, after the lecture, to 
I think, have some cookies and things in the lobby. So if you're more interested in things that are um, going on here at the aquarium, feel free to try to reach out to our staff. We'll have a number of people there. But for our sustainable seafood work, we really work with um, not only informing the public about how the use of your fork, um, to quote Barton Sieber, who I think is our sustainability fellow in residence here in the audience, talks a lot about how we impact the oceans through what we eat. And it's not just about educating all of you, but also educating companies and working with them as they have a huge opportunity to make an impact in their supply chain in terms of how fish are caught and farmed all around the world and end up on our plate. So one other connection um, I wanted to make um, is that we have been, for over a decade, involved in a marine protected area in the Pacific. Um, so for those of you that don't know, marine protected areas are one sort of tool in the toolbox to help protect the oceans. And we've been working with our colleagues at Conservation International, which is another conservation organization, and the Republic of Kiribati, which is a country. And can actually anybody in the audience raise their hands if you've heard of Kiribati? Spelled Kiribati. But yeah, a few of you. Well, definitely before my colleagues went to this place, I had never heard of it. So it's a small country with actually a lot of ocean area um, in the Pacific Ocean um, near Fiji and Samoa, but it actually takes about five days to get there by boat. Um, so, and as Alan points out, it takes five days to get back, which is probably the longer trip. Um, but we have helped this um, country establish a protected area that's over 400,000 square kilometers, and they've really been working diligently to put so many things into place to help protect these coral reef um, areas, and we'll be leading another expedition there, led by our coral reef scientist, Randy Rochin, here in the audience, um, in 2015 to continue to monitor these places. But one of the things you think about when it's five days by boat to get there is that this is a very remote place, and how do you have um, a lot of surveillance and enforcement for any kind of illegal fishing. So this work that Shah is going to talk to you about tonight is really interesting to us on all of these levels of um, sustainable seafood, i.e. fishing and marine protected areas, enforcement. The other thing that's really interesting um, that I want to mention is sort of how some of Shah's work is really thinking about innovations in the ocean and technology, right? And we're surrounded by technology now, and in some ways, so many of us are trying to keep up with the developments of technology. Um, but the aquarium has a long history of utilizing sort of innovations in, um, in fishing gear and in other things that have sort of spearheaded um, protection of particular species in the ocean. And I wanted to just mention a few. Um, the aquarium actually led the study to, that led to the development of a marine mammal bycatch device. That's a lot of terminology. But essentially what it led to was an acoustic device that would send off a ping um, that would alert dolphins to the presence of fishing gear like gill nets and actually reduce the amount of times that these dolphins would be caught in those nets. And that's been now a technology that's used around the world. Um, we also have invented and tested other bycatch reduction devices. Again, for those of you that don't know that term, it's like what we accidentally catch when we mean to catch something else. Um, and so one of our shark scientists in particular, John Mandelman, has worked on an electric decoy to reduce shark bycatch on long lines. Right? As you can imagine, um, fishermen don't want to catch things that they can't sell. And a lot of our work has actually piggybacked on how fishermen and scientists in the aquarium uh, researchers can work together to find win-win solutions. And this is what, in some ways, this conservation technology term is all about. I think the last thing is that we have a new project going on to identify how changing rope color might reduce large whale entanglements. And so here at the aquarium, we've been working on um, the endangered North Atlantic right whale for over 30 years. And thinking about how they get entangled in ropes and how we can reduce the likelihood of that. So all of these sort of innovations, I think, are really important to think about when we also think about how we start to utilize this increasing opportunity for technology um, to help make an impact in the oceans. So I want to turn to this incredible bio that I have here of Shah Selby and let you guys know a little bit more about him because um, I feel really honored to introduce him in terms of trying to tell you a little bit more about who he is and um, essentially, Shaw is you know, an engineer by trade, but he calls himself a conservation technologist. And so this is really the opportunity to use innovative approaches for um, ocean conservation. 
He spent the last eight years, so I'm gonna, these are words that don't normally always cross my lips, but a spacecraft propulsion scientist working on liquid and ion propulsion systems for satellites and other unmanned spacecrafts. So um, he certainly comes with a lot of talents that's actually led to projects working with companies like DirecTV, NASA, um, National Oceanic Administration as well. So Shaw's training began at UC Riverside. He was a chemical, trained as a chemical engineer and economics student. Um, he's gone on to graduate school at Stanford University School of um, Management Science and Engineering, which is really where he currently um, is working on his project FishNet, which you're going to hear obviously a lot about tonight. I want to tell you just a few sort of of the awards and honors that he's uh, received for some of the work he's done. This FishNet project in 2011 was um, chosen as the finalist for the Buckminster Fuller Challenge. Uh, he also was um, awarded the Savannah Ocean Exchange Gulfstream Navigator. So these are definitely around celebrating innovations of emerging science and technology. He was a nominee for a 2011 Keterva Award along that same thing. And this really, in some ways, led to his most recent um, role, which is a National Geographic Emerging Explorer, which is a really wonderful um, opportunity for him to essentially also share his views through the communications channels that National Geographic um, affords him. So again, I mentioned that he was awarded a grant from our Marine Conservation Action Fund, um, and our coordinator here for NCAF is here in the front, Elizabeth Stevenson, if you want to hear more about that project afterwards. He's held leadership roles with organizations like Engineers Without Borders, where he built homes in Mexico, uh, solar projects in Mali, and was awarded the Boeing Exceptional Volunteer Service Award. Um, so I think it's really incredible to think about all the work that, uh, that Shah has done in his sort of professional career. And you know, as most of you can attest to, there's also opportunities we find as we volunteer our time and energy. And he does a lot of work sort of helping um, inspire students to pursue careers in science and technology um, and think about the STEM program and how to help influence, as we like to call them, that next generation of ocean stewards. So I am really thrilled for him to be able to share his passion here tonight and, uh, and you all to hear much more about his work. Would you please help me welcome Shah Selby. All right, thank you for that introduction. Um, so hello everyone, uh, my name is Shah Selby. Um, I'm an engineer, which is it's kind of a strange thing to be involved in conservation work, but I'm here, I'm gonna tell you about how technology can help save our oceans. Um, so, as was mentioned, my day job is at Boeing. Uh, I work on propulsion and rocket engines for satellites. But uh, my, my passion really lied with um, elsewhere, and that's with ocean conservation. Um, so, I consider myself a conservation technologist um, in some of the projects that I work on. Um, and as was mentioned as well, in last year I was uh, inducted into the National Geographic's Explorer program as an emerging explorer um, for this work. Um, so it's a pretty neat, neat opportunity. But overall, I'm, I'm pretty much I'm a believer in engineering and its ability to fundamentally change the world. And so I'm trying to bring that to, to helping our oceans. OK, so, um, so what do you see when you look at this picture? I think this picture does a good job of, at explaining the, the, the issue that's inherent in ocean conservation. Well, when you look out there, you basically see what you see when you look anywhere in the oceans. You just see the surface. Um, and, and looking out at that, it's really difficult for the average person to tell whether the oceans under there are healthy or whether they're in peril. Um, if you think about it, it's, it's slightly different than um, some of the terrestrial conservation challenges. You can't quite count um, the number of bluefin tuna remaining as easily as you can with black rhinos or Mexican gray wolves. So it's really difficult to kind of show the sense of urgency that's needed in terms of of helping our oceans. But there's one way that we can tell very easily that the oceans need help, and um, that's through uh, monitoring fishing activity. So we have a problem with the way that we fish. Um, illegal fishing and, and overfishing threatens to damage our oceans um, irreparably. Uh, the, the, the devastation that this can cause, cause puts issues on global food security. Um, it impacts developing nations. Uh, and you know, a lot of this damage happens far beyond uh, the coasts where we can watch over things easily, and it turns this, the high seas basically into the Wild West. So I, I'm sure some of you guys have kind of heard some of the statistics on it. 
Um, our global fishing fleet's about two and a half times what would sustainably, the planet could sustainably handle, and we've become really, really good at, at, um, at extracting as many fish out of the water as we can and transporting them to any part of the world. Um, so what we need is, is a better way to watch over our oceans. So I'm going to start this out with a little story. In 2009, I traveled to Palau with a team of uh, people from Stanford University. It was uh, some individuals from the Center for Ocean Solutions and the College of Engineering. And we went out there to talk to the government and some of their college students and their business leaders about entrepreneurship. Um, but more specifically, it was focused around how they can start businesses and do things uh, from an entrepreneurial way that helps both their economy and their environment. Um, the, the, the series of meetings that we had was called Green Palau. Um, and so my role there was to talk about how they can use technology to help protect their oceans. Um, and I focused then specifically on low-cost technology. And the whole point was to protect this pristine environment that you see behind me here. And, you know, the timing when we went out there was perfect. Uh, the, the president of Palau stood up in front of the UN General <coughs> Assembly at that point and declared all of Palau's waters a shark sanctuary so no one could kill any sharks in Palau. While I was there, I did some field work. Uh, and I went and I talked to some of the people who, uh, you know, worked in the fisheries and, and um, people and conservationists and people who really should have an idea about what's going on in uh, Palau's waters. Um, and I asked them, you know, in, in that 600,000 square kilometer EEZ, uh, how many vessels do you think that are out there that Palau doesn't actually know about? So I wasn't ask, asking specifically for illegal fishing, but just how many boats do you think are there that, that they don't actually know? And, um, and repeatedly the answer that I got was that they thought it was just, you know, just maybe a handful, it was, wasn't very many. Um, well. Uh, you know, luckily around the same time, an Australian military plane was flying over the area, and in just one uh, flight path, uh, they found over 70 unaccounted for vessels uh, in Palau's waters. Um, and so this wasn't a comprehensive search, it was just one, one kind of flyover. Um, but what this, what this story tells us is something that we already kind of know, and it's that there's a problem out there with, uh, with, that's actually larger than what we think it is. So there's a perception problem. There's a disconnect between what people think is going on and what's actually going on. Um, see, this, this perception problem is really happening anywhere we look, and thankfully we've gotten some, <coughs> some data on that. Uh, Operation Kuru Kuru is, a, is an effort taken by the uh, Pacific Island Foreign Fisheries Agency, which is like an inter, intergovernmental agency among some of the islands out there. And every, every couple years, or every year for the last couple years, they do uh, kind of this coordinated marine surveillance effort. And they go out and look and see how many fishing boats are out there. Um, and so if you look at the, the year after I went to Palau in 2010, um, the patrol area covered over uh, 12 million square kilometers. That was the total area they wanted to, uh, that they were looking at for this. And they identified 195 foreign vessels of interest. If you were to fast forward that to, um, to last year, uh, the search area increased to 30 million square kilometers, and in that area they found over 1,000 foreign vessels of interest. Um, so not all these were, were necessarily IUU vessels, but they were vessels that, um, that they, were, they were definitely looking at. So in three years, the, the number of uh, foreign vessels increased by almost an order of magnitude. Um, you think that was because they all of a sudden built a lot more fishing vessels? Um, no, it's, it's, it's probably just because we looked more, because it appears that the more we look, uh, the more we find. So this is actually particularly relevant now because just a few weeks ago, Palau's current president stood up again in front of the U UN General Assembly and declared their entire EEZ close to, to fishing. So this is a pretty unprecedented and bold move. Um, uh, particularly since fishing is, is tied to some of the aid, aid funds. Um, but as impressive as this is, uh, how would Palau protect all that water? Those 600,000 square kilometers, how are they going to do that? Well, you're looking at it. One single patrol vessel. And, and you know, oftentimes it's really difficult for them to even get this thing out of port because they can't come up with the money to fuel it and maintain it. So you have a dilemma here where you have just one coastal nation where we're talking about here, Palau, with the knowledge of illegal vessels extracting fish out of their waters and the need to protect the sanctuary of fish over 600,000 square kilometers. 
And so Palau is a country made up of over 300 islands. And you know, the, the, the reefs out there are, are considered one of the seven wonders of the underwater world. So that's all to be protected by a single patrol boat. Can it be done? So there's a, the reason why is there's, there's a problem with how we're doing things today. Um, right now, we only use technology and methods that are decades old to protect our oceans. Our fishing boats are getting faster and, and more efficient while we're using the same old enforcement mechanisms to, to monitor them. Um, we patrol the waters using donated military vessels, and they sometimes fall, fly, or follow an arbitrary path when they do. Uh, we borrow time on military aircraft as a secondary mission, and a lot of those flights are limited by pilot fatigue, and they can cost anywhere from um, you know, 100000 to the millions of dollars per flight. We rely on cooperative reporting of vessel location, and we put all that information in databases, and none of that data talks to each other or communicates with each other. And we use paper forms to collect and log information, you know, with the risk that those forms are just going to be filed away forever. See, the truth is we can make all the improvements in the world and laws and treaties, but if, if we don't have an effective way to monitor our oceans, then, you know, they're inherently flawed. And so we're really looking at this problem of inter, uh, illegal and unrelated, unregulated fishing in uh, uncollaborative ways. And I've seen this in other parts of the world as well. Um, last year I went to Barbuda with the Weight Institute and helped with their Barbuda Blue Halo project. It's um, a collaborative effort with the people of Barbuda to determine the best way to sustainably manage their waters. Uh, and I was asked to come and look at this from an enforcement and technology perspective. Well, what do you think the single most, concern, most common concern they had was? What about enforcement? So all of the, the fishermen that we talked out there believed in closing their, the closing reserves and to fishing because they all thought that it could help the future of fishing. But they all realized that that protection was critical. So how can we improve this? Well, I think that the answer is here. I think it's with technology. I think this can be our silver bullet. We, uh, we're living in a time where technological capabilities can finally start to make a difference with our oceans. And I think it's fundamental that conservation kind of embraces this. Um, so I'll tell a little bit about where we're at right now. You see, technology development traditionally follows what is considered um, the technology S-curve. And so if you think about it, it makes a lot of sense. Basically, when a, a technology comes out, it's kind of slow to start. It gains a little momentum, and once it's considered mainstream is when it hits that, that threshold on the top. Um, and if you look at technology for the last 100 years, it follows the same basic shape. Um, from the automobile to the cell phone, it mirrors this, this S-curve. But um, as the decades progress, you can notice that technology adoption grows faster. So we see how computers and mobile phones have basically changed our lives in the last 20 years. Well, technology just keeps getting smarter and smaller and more capable. See, we're living in a new age, and it's, it's a really exciting time to be alive. We send humanoid robots to the International Space Station to help the astronauts. 3D printers are starting, up to, starting to show up in people's homes and changing the relationship we have with the products in our house. Prosthetics are becoming increasingly sophisticated, and we're starting to use mind control to, to control them. And we're creating these engineered extensions of humanity that can help us understand uh, ourselves better. See, we're, we're living right now in this, this age of the maker, where someone can be a technology entrepreneur and change the course of, the in, of an industry or the world in, in months and not decades. Um, before, in the old days, it was almost impossible to be a technology entrepreneur unless you had access to a factory um, and a lot of money. Um, but now you can design something and you can print it on a 3D printer, the prototype on a 3D printer, and send that file off to get manufactured somewhere in the world all without leaving your couch. So it's a, it's a pretty exciting time to be alive. And one of those areas where this innovation is booming is in the field of robotics. We put a rover the size of a Mini Cooper on another planet, which is pretty crazy. And we did it in the most incredible way possible. So I'm not sure if any of you guys have seen the YouTube video called Seven Minutes of Terror, which explained how they landed that thing on there. But from a propulsion engineer's point of view, it's basically insane. Um, and unmanned aircraft are getting smaller and smarter by the day. Um, it's really 
really phenomenal how this technology is growing and it's, it's going to change our economy. We're going to see how it changes everything in the next 10 years. So now, technology and innovation is not new to the oceans. People like Jacques Cousteau and Sylvia Earle have been using technology to inspire us for, for decades. Um, and it's helped our, our fisheries become exceedingly efficient at what they do. But what I'm talking about here is a new type of technology. Um, it's one that has one foot in previous technology efforts and another in, in what's not traditionally considered ocean technology. So what's this look like? So this, this is a bit of a busy chart, but I think it's really important to understand that I think that the, the, the innovations that we need to make here follow two big parallel paths. One, the bottom path, we need to increase the, the ways we look at the oceans, increase the ways we observe the oceans. And then the top path, the second one, is we, can, we have to become more efficient on how we deal with that information. Um, so we need, these two things would have done a lot to be, better characterize that problem that we saw in Palau. So we need cheaper platforms to be able to observe and monitor the ocean that aren't currently tied to the military like I was talking about earlier. We have to make use of open source technology and things like satellite imagery and drones and smartphones. And as technology gets smaller and smarter and, and faster, we have to be pulling those into conservation efforts. And finally, that information needs to be com collected and compiled and managed in a way that we can share it amongst each other. And we can free up resources and, and everything becomes more actionable. Um, because we have to collaborate and build the true picture of what's going on right now. The information we have about there about what's going on in the oceans right now is, is essentially non-existent in this way. So it boggles my mind that we can't pull all the information about a vessel that's found shark fin finning in the South Pacific when that same vessel shows up in South Africa. Um, so, the, so the next couple of slides I'm going to talk through are really going to be some of the, some of the technologies that I've worked on. Uh, I know there's a lot of controversy around drone technology. So I think a few of you guys probably even cowered when I said the word drone earlier. Um, but you know, just like the internet um, that was partially developed under military funding and it's kind of been commandeered by the public, um, I think that, that UAV technology or drones will, will, will do the same. Um, it will be able to take conservation to new heights. Um, it's really what's considered a general purpose technology, which means we can use it for good and we can use it for bad. <coughs> And we're at a really interesting time right now when it comes to drones. Um, we're, at, we're at a point where, where open source drones made by hobbyists, remote control airplane people, um, are outnumbering the military counterparts. These are built at like the hobbyist levels and they're, they're made using you know, a couple hundred dollars, using information and designs that are shared by a bunch of people online, a bunch of hobbyists online all around the world. It's a really remarkable phenomenon that's happening right here. Um, and and it's, it's unique in that you have these industries, the toy industry and the hobby industry, that are innovating just as fast as you see the military industrial complex doing it. And, and basically the reason why is, is because of this. It's because of smartphones. So all the sensors necessary to make an autopilot for a, for a drone um, have been miniaturized and mass produced to meet the needs of this. The camera, the, the batteries, the processors, everything. Um, it's, it's really this interesting time. So I, I, I'm on a grant right now with National Geographic, I'm going to explain a little bit right now, um, to try and harness that and, and bring that technology to protecting our oceans. It, the, the grants National Geographic and Lindblad Expedition Fund for the Ocean, and I'm putting together guidance on how conservationists can use this um, and build their own for cheap. Um, so it involves a testing of a number of different types of plane configurations to figure out really what works best. Um, the project's called Soar Ocean. So the next, uh, the next slide is going to show a video. So uh, as I said, I'm testing multiple different platforms. This video right here is going to show testing one of the quadcopter platforms. And this one just has a GoPro. But um, this thing, basically, this is how it works right out of the box. I didn't really have to do anything with it. So that's not how things used to be when it comes to, to drone technology. And I could set it up to go follow certain waypoints and patrol an area or take imagery as, um, as I want. So we watch a little bit of this fly.
he's already pretty smart enough. I'm, I'm not very good at playing these things. <laughs> but it, it looks like I am. So that's because it's, it's smart enough to correct. as uh, the technology grows. Right now it's, um, the FAA is, is really looking at bringing co commercial drones into the airspace and what that means, but there's just tons and tons of companies and people looking to uh, use these for agriculture or land surveying and lots of stuff like that. There's actually a, um, a yearly competition right now where they have um, hobbyist people build them to try and stop rhino poachers. So, there's a lot of potential to get the AI This is all done off the coast of California, so the, the, um, the purpose of this is to test these in California. Yeah, and so, so there's a bunch of different types. This one, as you saw, is a quad, quad rotor, so it means it has four little blades on it. Um, but the, the majority of my work is done on using the regular fixed clean, clean version ones of these because we're trying to get pretty long distances and go out into marine protected areas or, or uh, fly for quite a, quite a distance. Um, you're going to see a video of me kind of moving around. You can see the, the um, camera stay steady the whole time. So the information about this project is on uh, soilocean.org and also a, a Twitter. Um, <coughs> um, and as I mentioned, we're going to test these off the coast of California and show how you can do it easier, um, less dangerous for the, for the pilot involved, and more frequently than what we're doing today. Um, another thing that I've worked with is, uh, is balloon technology, so it's somewhat less sophisticated uh, than drones, but it's, it's really capable for the, for the cost. This we were doing, for this effort, we were just doing some mapping um, in Apollonia Cove in, in um, Southern California. Um, but I think some of you guys may have seen some of the YouTube clips where a bunch of high school students get together and they build one of these balloons and, and send it up and, and take pictures of the edge of the atmosphere. So there's quite a bit you can do with them. And uh, Google is actually working on a project called Project Loon, uh, which they're going to be launching a, a number of these uh, free-flying balloons to fly around the world and, and, and basically provide internet to people. Um, from the, from the balloon. So there's really no reason why a similar approach can't be used to give us some eyes over some marine sanctuaries or, or, or help otherwise. Um, and another thing I want to talk about is satellite technology. So, so really one of the best ways we can look at some of the most re remote regions of the world is through satellite technology. Um, as as you, uh, you heard earlier, some places it takes so long to get out there that it's difficult to have a boat or maybe even a drone. Um, the current drones they have right now looking at that stuff. Um, but we've all seen the huge popularity in Earth imaging over, uh, over recent years, um, the prevalence of Google Maps and things like that in our daily lives. Um, you know, it's, it's really changed the way that we, we deal with things there. And, um, and there's been a, a number of interesting conservation challenges that have been solved using this as well. Um, it, just like this image that you see here, uh, this is a situation where some random people were on Google Maps and they caught some um, illegal fishermen in the Canary Islands uh, just by looking at Google Maps. Um, so uh, an investigation was started by the European Union and I think they caught the people involved. Um, but just imagine what you could do with, the, with the, the three million square kilometers of imagery that's taken each day. And that's very recently going to change um, quite a bit. And, and so what I think the real exciting stuff happening in satellite technology is this stuff. It's the miniaturization and privatization of this tech. Um, I'm really fascinated what people have done with small satellite platforms. And when I talk about small satellite platforms, um, a traditional satellite costs something on the order of $80 million to $300 million or something like that. If you wanted to build a, a satellite like GOI that's going to take pictures of the, of the Earth, it's going to cost you something on that, uh, around that. It's going to cost you about the same to launch it um, 
and, and ensure it. Now, there's, there's a lot of people now that are working on small satellite platforms and they're using CubeSats. And so CubeSat is basically a 10 centimeter by 10 centimeter standard of satellites where people have all developed parts for and you can you can build one of these for tens of thousands of dollars or even less. There's there's high schools out there that have built one. Um, but but they're doing really interesting things with it. Like there's a university, Alborg University in Denmark, they built one that can take uh, readings via space AIS system so it can track vessels from using a small small cube. And then the ones up here are um, uh, is Planet Labs, and so they they built a three U cube sat, which is basically you know the ten centimeters wide and, and thirty centimeters long, and it has a camera inside, so they can take pictures of the Earth, actually pretty good pictures of the Earth. And they just launched a few of these from the International Space Station, um, and they're going to be you know orbiting the Earth, looking at uh, uh, satellite imagery. So that gives us an opportunity to do some pretty interesting stuff. Uh, in terms of uh, in terms of ocean monitoring, uh, but we don't always have to rely on big technologies like those. Um, so we're now at a point where we can easily reach out to anybody to to help. Um, current estimates put the number of people that are going to be connected through the internet by um, 2020 at over five billion. So that makes us have this opportunity where we can kind of build this army of armchair conservationists to help with us and help report things via smartphones or SMS or internet technology to document what they see is happening in our oceans. Um, so there's been lots of conversations in the science realm about, um, about uh, citizen science, crowdsourcing science, getting the public involved in this. Well, I call this stuff um, um, citizen protection. So I I, to demonstrate that, I created npaguardian.org. It's basically a, a website and an app to create this public-led watchdog culture about what's happening in, in California. And right now, it's just in the California Marine Protected Area Network. Um, so if we can increase the number of potential of wa potential watchdogs out there, the number of people who have the ability to report something if they see something bad happening, it, it creates like this deterrence factor amongst people and, and increases the risk to people who want to go there and, and damage the oceans. Um, so people can, can contribute to this further through the web or, or downloading um, iPhone and Android apps, which we have a, there's an iPhone app in the, uh, in the app store. Um, and then you can even expand this further. So the thought behind this whole MPA Guardian Patrol aspect of it is basically when you have all these people that are um, taking pictures or trying to document the stuff, you can get it directly into the hands of the people who are doing it. So gathering intel is a big part of what enforcement does. And it helps them figure out where the problem is, what they're actually going to do with it, where they're going to patrol, and things like that. So if you can gather all this crowdsourced information from people out there, then it should go directly into, into their hands, and it should impact where, they, where they're going for patrolling, and, and help them kind of standardize the way they gather information and, and execute. So um, there's, there's another effort that I've been working on, and, and it's kind of based around this amazing uh, it, level of innovation we've seen in um, open source <coughs> hardware. So there's these things called Arduinos or Raspberry Pis. They're basically microcontrollers or little little mini computers, one board computers that allow you to to do a lot of stuff with them. And people have have gotten them to made them into like cameras that in their house or control their um, their air conditioning with them and things like that. But you can actually build them to use them to build interesting sensors that help you monitor and protect the ocean. And so one example, uh, if you look up on the right, is, is acoustic sensors. So basically all vessels radiate underwater noise as, you know, as they pass through an area. And so um, acoustic uh, ocean sensor technology like this hydrophone basically is just listening for the environment around the sensor. Um, you can build one of these little microcontroller sensors that will, will use one of these passive hydrophones and it will listen to the ambient noise and when a boat passes by, you know, the, the ambient noise will change and it can, you know, without being detected, tell that somebody's there. And, and I built them to operate on cellular networks. So basically, if you put out a whole array of these down a river or something like that and then a boat passes through, they'll, as the boat passes, each one of those will send a text message saying, hey, it's here, hey, it's here, hey, it's here. Um, <laughs> So it's basically like the equivalent of, of those um, motion sensor lights that you everybody has above their garage, uh, but for the oceans. 
Um, but the, the really amazing thing is one of these sensors can be built for dirt cheap. Um, the whole thing, you know, the, that acoustic part can be built for under $20 and, and the whole thing together definitely in there, under $100. Um, and it can connect to whatever communication mechanism you want it to. Um, so it's an inexpensive way to monitor. Um, and, and we're actually, the bottom one, the into the Akavango, we're, we're building a series of these um, <coughs> environmental sensors. It's me and a, a couple of other of the uh, National Geographic explorers. And we're going to deploy these in, in the delta out there. And um, the intent is to gather a bunch of data and incorporate it into this map. And they're going to use all that uh, to help to try and get um, UNESCO World Heritage status for the delta. So, um, and then additionally, we're, um, planning on setting up some uh, National Geographic engineering camps um, to help help some uh, grade school students build these. And they can learn STEM engineering principles along the way. Um, and so an, an extension on that, I, I talked a little bit earlier about uh, kind of cooperative tracking when, when people send location. And, and one of those cooperative tracking methods is, is VMS. So VMS is Vessel Monitoring System. Basically, it's a tracker that a fisherman can put on his boat that says, hey, I'm here, and it sends the, hey, I'm here message every, every so often. And the whole point behind that is if somebody's legitimate and they want to prove that they're legitimate, they can put it on their boat. And it helps the fisheries management manage things better, and it helps identify the people who are not legitimate. The problem behind these things is they're very expensive, and a lot of these smaller fishing vessels can't really afford them. They can't spend thousands of dollars to, to put something on their boat, and um, they, they hardly even make that much. Um, so I, using kind of the same platform that I was talking about before, I created these really low-cost ones called Ultra VMS that can, instead of basically having a sensor, it has a GPS data logger, and it sends the, sends the message the same way. Um, so this is huge because it, it will allow us to kind of manage things in places that can't afford all the expensive stuff that we have um, here in the U.S., so when we're talking about technology, it's, it's very easy to get caught up in, in the big, expensive, sexy technologies out there. Um, but it's important to focus, uh, to think that there's also like simple low-tech solutions that can, that can help to be um, just as effective. And so that was a big effort in the Barbuda Blue Halo stuff that I was working on, finding the low-cost ways to make reserves successful. And a lot of those actually um, are through uh, mobile technologies and using what people out there in the field already have, um, text message-based technology and things like that. So there's, there's plenty of good work to be done um, in this across the globe. So um, I only named a, a few examples of the technology here, um, but there's a lot of stuff out there that's, that's available to help. Um, we have uh, platforms and information systems that can really eliminate the disconnect that I talked about earlier in this talk about what's truly happening in our oceans. Um, and I think that conservationists and engineers need to start working together more to solve these problems. So my, I have a personal dream, and my personal dream is to try and inspire the next generation of engineers not to you know, want to choose a job at an internet company optimizing ad delivery, um, but solving you know, the environmental and, and conservation challenges of the time, you know, where just that little bit of technology can really, really make the difference and, and change everything. So what I've learned uh, from my work with engineers throughout borders is there's really not anything um, like, a, like a truly inspired, passionate engineer that can really change the world. All right, thank you. It was a pleasure to see you. The question was that I, I say that overfishing is damaging the ocean, but I don't compare with how badly climate change is, is damaging the ocean. Um, yeah, so, so I, I think that the... Uh, I think a lot of the information out there about how overfishing is, is changing things in terms of declining fish catch and, and, and what the fisheries are saying is, is, is already out there. Um, I didn't focus much on it for this, for this talk. I don't know if there's someone who knows a lot more about um, the fisheries specifically that wants to say something to that. As Shaw speaks um, about the development of technology, fishermen have been improving their ability to catch fish for a long time. And I think that we have a lot of people working in that space. And this, you know, new developments around technology that Shaw points out, I think are really going to be helpful um, for how we 
uh, address the challenges that face our oceans in terms of fisheries, but your question also was about climate change. And I think it is really important. I mean, we've certainly recognized the impact that climate change has um, on our oceans. One of the biggest challenges is how to do something about it, right? There's a lot of work. Um, there's a lot of two terms that get bandied about a lot, mitigation and adaptation, right? And in fisheries, we do a lot of work trying to change things and improve the practices. One of the things that we spend a lot of time here, even at the aquarium doing, is teaching about climate change and its impact on the oceans. There's potentially some things that we're not going to be able to change the trajectory of, for instance, the oceans becoming more acidic. And how are shellfish going to deal with that when they create skeletons that depend on the oceans being a certain pH, right? So, I mean, I think we we certainly, um, and speaking on behalf of my colleagues here at the aquarium, recognize that climate change is a really significant threat to our oceans, and we need to be doing as much as we can on many different levels about that, not just at education, but also adaptation and, and mitigation. Some really good efforts right now there to protect more of the oceans, to do a little bit more like what we're doing on land um, in terms of letting these areas kind of um, build up with the fish populations and, and come back into a healthy state. Uh, but, but the issue is right now, as we currently stand, we we can't afford to protect what we're trying to protect right now. There's a lot of countries out there, most of the developing world, that either don't have a vessel for any kind of enforcement, they don't have a Coast Guard, or they, as I mentioned, they have one boat, but they don't have any ability to kind of uh, fuel it and, and actually use it effectively. And so a lot of what I work on is trying to find things out there, technologies and, and other stuff that, um, that can help to reduce that burden and, and change that. Um, the other thing is there's a lot of parts of the ocean that we don't have any real data on. We don't really know what's going on out there. We have an idea. There's been certain studies where they flew, flew a vessel over a couple of years ago or something like that. But there, there hasn't necessarily been a, a more frequent and consistent understanding of what's going on in the oceans um, from a monitoring and you know, surveillance standpoint. And that's kind of what I'm trying, to, I'm trying to change. Because I think if you can quantify that, if you can show um, the size of the problem, it's easier to work against it, right? It's easier to, to do something about it if you know what's happening out there versus if we're just using unqualified statements about what's happening out there. I think the question was how, like, about my personal story and how I got to where I am um, today. Uh, yeah, I, I do still work on non-conservation um, engineering stuff. I, I think that, that me personally, I, you know, I. I love engineering. I believe in engineering. I think that it can do a lot of good in the world. And, and you know, I, I like the science side of things. And I got, got a job working in engineering at the kind of, you know, corporate level and, and maybe desired something more, right? And so that's why I got involved with uh, Engineers Without Borders. And that's what's kind of uh, fueled me for all these years to work on conservation. Um, yeah, no, Engineers Without Borders is a wonderful organization. They, they definitely uh, help uh, inspire me in, in many ways, but yeah, this new direction came basically during uh, graduate school. The question was, how do you use um, how do you use this kind of stuff to find the people that don't want to be found, basically, right? Right. So um, there, there's a few ways to do it. That's one of the areas I'm excited about is the satellite imagery and, and things like Planet Labs. And the reason why is because. I think if you get more readily available um, imagery, then you can start doing something about it. So one way is if you have VMS data about where boats are, if you have a map showing where all the legitimate fishermen are, and then you have a photograph of where all the fishing vessels overall are, then you, know, you can kind of deduce that all the remaining boats, the ones that aren't on the VMS map, are likely doing something they don't want people to know where they're at. And if it's in an area, like you said, where they have to have VMS to be in that area, then they're illegal fishermen, right? right. Um, so that's that's one way. Basically, we have to figure out uh, ways to observe them without without them knowing. You know, and that's some of like the satellite, the drones, um, some other kind of things like that. Question was like how? What's the frequency of false alarms um, that you get? So um, for for a crowdsource type thing. Now the the MPA Guardian one, it had, it's a smaller effort right now. I would suspect if it gets to the to the level where it's um, you know national or international, you you would get a large amount of of false reports. But um, the so the the people who developed 
some of the software behind that tool. They've worked on trying to figure out false reports. There's some things you can do from the, you get, you get the report in and you can tell based on um, the, the person or the time or where it came from. There's a little bit of characterization you can do in, in that. You can, also, um, you can also potentially team up with verified reporters as opposed to you know, unverified reporters and treat those reports as having a higher level of of um, validity than, than, than other ones. There's a, it's all on the data side, right, to, to figure out how to manage, manage that stuff. The open source platforms that I'm talking about, they just basically have different sensors plugged into them, right? So if you want to tell temperature and, and all that other kind of stuff that you would do on an ocean health thing, you can do exactly the same, exactly the same thing. Put it on a buoy or a float or something. The question was, uh, what kind of stuff have, have I done to help with people who want to be legitimate, what legitimate fishers would do, and then, and then ultimately people who are, want to make sure that the source comes, kind of like a traceability type, type thing, right? Right, um, or in some way using the information. I mean, tra again, traceability um, ha has other market components, but specifically what we're looking to do, and I think what you're looking to do, is to remove the economic incentive mm -hmm. for illegal fishing. So if we had the ability to put tools into the hands of those who are sourcing fish to determine whether the vessel that they're buying fish from has IUU fish or whether they've fished in areas that aren't legal, mm -hmm. you know, they can turn them away right. and ultimately they can shut it down from that perspective. Yeah, so, the, uh, yeah, that's, I mean, that's ultimately the goal with getting better information about what's going on out there is, um, so, you know, these have been piloted in certain areas and some of them are in earlier stages of technology development. But you know, I, I'm willing to work with whatever groups are interested in trying to, to put these things out in the field and actually get people to start using them. But the, but the ultimate goal is as you get like, better information about what's happening out there, that that stuff's going to be easily shared and traceable and, and collaborated upon. And that includes the knowing that the fish from that vessel wasn't necessarily um, you know, caught legally. So the question was, how do you go from doing like a one-off um, open source development thing to, to kind of full scale and having thousands of them. Um, yeah, that's, I mean, that's a, that's a good question. Um, I'll tell you when I have thousands of them. <laughs> no, I mean, I think a part of it has to do with just, the, it's the technology development process, right? How you move from one to the other. I, I, um, a lot of what, I, what I'm um, working on right now is to show that these can be built very cheaply right now using what's out there. Um, but if, if there was a, a plan to build these on a larger scale, then obviously there's ways that you can lower the cost even further and optimize if you move beyond using the, the stuff that's available at the source right now into using kind of one-off developed technologies. Um, that's, uh, I think right now my focus really is to get things out there and start to be used by, by people all over the world. And so my focus is gonna stick to um, the open source, at least for right now, until I can see that demand um, for, for more coming and then, and then figure out that. When's your Kickstarter? I've thought about that, but I don't know. Yes, when, when the Kickstarter is going to be. The question was if, if I got a sense that governments would be behind um, enforcement once these these start places start um, things start going into place, and I think that I think yeah, of course. What I've noticed working in in um, a lot of the poorer coastal nations is that they you know they're frustrated. A lot of them are frustrated about not being able to do anything and and not being able to afford fuel costs and stuff like that. And so if you give them a, an opportunity um, that that lets them do things for cheaper and and especially if it's some technology that they think is, is cool and, and works well in that, that area, yeah, they, they get behind it completely. I mean, just that story of, uh, of Plow, very recently the, um, the government worked with this, this company called Aeroson and they, they did uh, drone tests in terms of protecting, like trying to see if they can monitor Plow's waters. And um, for everything I heard about it was very successful. So there's a lot of interest there. The question was, what funding sources do I know of that could help um, with kind of student-led uh, projects um, to build some of this stuff? And the second part of the question was uh, where I would focus on if I were, were to do those kinds of things. Um, from, a, from a funding standpoint, I'm, I'm not exactly sure 
uh, what would be the best answer there. I, I know there's lots of people who are interested in, in it um, in lots of organizations, but and, and I suspect that if it's attached to a school, it might, it might be easier um, to get funding through some of those channels. Um, but I, I don't know too much about that. Um, it, to answer your question in terms of where the focus should be, I think the like the, the glider kind of um, aerial based stuff might be a little bit um, more interesting and have a higher potential than the underwater stuff. Now, to the inverse of that would be that the, the underwater stuff, there's a far less development happening in it. So if you do want them to do something where there's a little bit, um, they might come up with something new or, or have more of an impact, then the underwater stuff for sure would be would be a little bit more interesting. We were talking about that earlier um, in some of our meetings about um, you know underwater gliders. There's there's not there's there's people making underwater gliders. There's not a lot of people making uh, kind of open source type of you know, inexpensive underwater gliders, right? Mm -hmm.